Um, hi, everybody. I don't know that I've met all of you already. So I'm Cecilia. You can also call me Cece. And I've been at Ticketmaster for a year. I moved down from the Silicon Valley last year to be warmer, but I still wanted to be in tech because I've been working the past 15 years at Apple, Expedia, Netflix, Microsoft all the big tech companies, but now I get to come to LA and finally have a life and have fun and be warm. Um, and I took product school when I first got hired as a product manager. I was sort of on a trial run and I was trying to figure out what is product management, what are all my responsibilities and duties. So product school was really great. I took it in San, um, San Francisco for two months and it was just awesome because by the end I just had a much better understanding of exactly what I was responsible for. And I think as a product manager you're always trying to figure out what's your ownership and what's your part to play. What are you in charge of? And people will say everything. That's not necessarily true, but it definitely covers a, a large swath. Um, so I'm in the Hollywood office, Live Nation. And feel free to get my contact info and come visit me right there on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And at Ticketmaster, um, there's a lot of products. There's the, the B2C side, which I'm on business to customer, and then there's the B2B side, which is more of Live Nation, working with the venues and the artists and those types of people. How many people have used Ticketmaster in some capacity? Wow, oh my gosh. Um, how many people have used the mobile apps, the iOS and Android apps? Oh, that's a lot too. Okay, that's what my team is currently working on. And so, there's a lot going on here. We have the Ticketmaster.com site, which is looks like it's from the 90s. It has a whole bunch of stuff going on. There's a lot of ads. There's a lot of sponsorship. Um, it has all the bells and whistles. Then there's the iOS and Android apps, which are doing really well. Like They're very well reviewed. Um, they make a lot of money. They're just kind of chugging along. We have this brand new beta site. So if you visit Ticketmaster on your mobile phone, you might go into the progressive web app that's being developed. About 50% of traffic is being routed there. And then we have an ancient M dot site left over from the last decade, but that's still something that we have as well. So working at Ticketmaster is kind of crazy because there's so many different platforms, and each one of these different entry points has its own product management team, its own development team, its own set of designers. So there's a lot of moving pieces, and then every single one of these has to integrate with services on the back end. And this is the most technical job I've ever had in my life. I've never had to integrate with so many SDKs and APIs and work with data sciences and develop algorithms, but it's so exciting. It's like, wow, I can't believe I get to do this. I feel like pinching myself every morning. It's really fun. So about maybe three months ago, we started to think about what could we do at Ticketmaster that's different than we've been doing now, especially on the B2C side, like how can we make things better for our fans, and why would we want to build something new? So I'm a huge Star Trek fan, and um, Star Trek is it's, it's old as well, and so is Ticketmaster. It started in 1976, so it's 41 years of history, and each iteration has pretty much been the same. There really hasn't been anything revolutionary or really, really new in a long time, um, much like Star Trek Discovery. So we were thinking, like, how could we do something really bold and interesting and innovative and experimental and different? And that's what we've been working on for the past couple of months. Has anyone seen Discovery? No truckies? I saw the first. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, they also have that pay model, so I wouldn't expect a lot of people <laughs> to watch it. Um, so we started to think, like, how can we create a fan-centric experience? So once again, a Ticketmaster is very complex. You've got the B2C side, you've got the B2B side, and both sides sort of, like, fight over what's more important. Is it more important to adhere to the client, to the Hollywood Bowl, what they want Ticketmaster to be, or is it more important to adhere to the person off the street who's paying for the ticket? I'm on the customer side. Coming from Apple, I'm very customer-focused. I'm always thinking about that person with their phone in their hand just trying to get their ticket to Beyonce or Taylor Swift and what are their needs and what are their problems. And so as a, as a team of engineers and designers and product people, we thought, how can we find out what fans want? And we thought, let's just get out of the office and go talk to them. So we stalked people near the Greek theater and <laughs> we just waited for them to come by. We were wearing Ticketmaster shirts and we just started to ask them questions about how did they find out about the event? And where did they buy it? And what were their expectations? And we started to gather all of this feedback and really learn where all of their pain points were and all of their frustrations. 
Um, people were pretty forthcoming, and so we had a great time just talking with people. And then we started to bring people on site as well. So we started to reach out to thousands of people in the LA area who loved concerts. We were very focused on like the artist at this point, and so we started to bring people in-house and show them different mocks and designs, but more just fundamentally talking about needs and pain points and challenges, and also things that made them happy. Um, and it's easy to get people to talk about music events because pretty much everybody loves music. So my job is not too hard. Yeah. Um, and we found that, that there were a lot of problems that Ticketmaster was not addressing. Um, number one is there's absolutely no personalization really with Ticketmaster. There's like the minimum amount. So if you ever get those emails from Ticketmaster saying, here's your personal events. We handpicked them just for you. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. <laughs> it's um, not entirely personalized. Um, we don't have mandatory login, so there's not a lot of people who log into the app. Usually you log in when you want to buy, um, but at the same time, because there's no personalization, people aren't coming repeatedly back to the app to browse. Um, we don't know that you, know, you like a certain artist and therefore we should recommend you these other artists. We don't have any integrations. And so we started talking about personalization and we still don't have Facebook login. That's why Colin McLaughlin, Agent Dale Cooper, is saying, what year is this? Did anybody watch Twin Peaks The Return? Okay, very obscure, it's fine. Um, but it was really good. So we're, we're looking at, you know, how can we integrate with services like Spotify and Facebook and Shazam and bringing in people's personalized um, recommendations. We, we talked to fans, we found out there was no reason for them to really engage or come back to the app. A lot of people just deleted the Ticketmaster app after they bought their tickets. They take a screenshot of their ticket, they delete the app, maybe they'd open it again when they needed it, but they thought, well, I got everything that I need from this, why would I still have this app? Because they weren't using the Ticketmaster app to discover any of their events. They would hear about it pretty much everywhere else on the internet except for Ticketmaster. So we thought, well, we definitely need a better discovery experience and a reason for people to come back. We don't have any coupons or discounts or any incentives. Um, there's no promise of getting a ticket. So we did start this really cool new thing called Verified Fan. Bruce Springsteen is a part of it. And what it does is it gets you a code to get you in the door to maybe get you a ticket. But you're still kind of part of a lottery. So there's no guaranteed seat. And then there's no guarantee of the best deal because we don't do a really good job of merchandising. You don't know, like, this is a better deal than StubHub or this is a better deal than SeatGeek. It's kind of like Ticketmaster has the monopoly on the ticketing industry, so we just expect people to come to us. But those of us sitting in the Hollywood office are like, well, we definitely have to do better. We definitely can't assume that just because we have a monopoly that everyone's always going to come to us all the time. Like, the StubHubs of the world are nipping at our heels. Um, there's also no bulletproof entry, so when you have your mobile phone, people are concerned about cellular learned at data connections trying to get into an event, or what if my phone dies or if my battery gives out and I can't pull up my mobile entry. So a lot of people are paranoid and they still print out paper tickets. And so it feels very archaic. And then finally, there's no global app. You can't download the UK version of the Ticketmaster app, buy a ticket for a concert in the US, and come to the US and get into the concert. Um, and there's a lot of technology reasons why there's no global app. So these are a lot of the complaints that we heard from fans, a lot of the opportunities and challenges, and we also realized that we were dealing with a whole mess of technology problems <laughs> as well. So we're dealing with a company built in the 70s. Um, iOS and Android, they're kind of chugging along, but there's no new innovation, and plus every time um, we put new features into the app, that app just grows and grows and grows, and then we did crossed the dreaded 100 megabytes earlier this year and had to pull it from the app store and immediately start taking things out because once you cross 100 megabytes and you can't download it over um, data, you have to use Wi-Fi. We're like, we don't want to do that. Um, then we have to wait for the app store to approve. This isn't a problem with Google Play, but this is a problem with the iTunes store. The release process is just slow. And then we can't catch up to the rest of the business channels. Like when the mobile web team releases something, they just do it like that. For us, it's like really cumbersome and difficult and just takes a long time. And then there's all these different tech stacks worldwide, like the tech stacks are just insane on all the different platforms and all the different product managers and 
it's a, just a huge undertaking. And then, um, like I said, I've never seen so many APIs and SDKs in my life at Ticketmaster. It's like every third person down the hall is making their own API. And sometimes it'll come to fruition, and sometimes it'll meet your requirements, and sometimes it won't. And you're just constantly negotiating with all these areas of the business to figure out, will this work for mobile? And if it won't work for mobile, then what do we need to do to make it work? So we had an inception. Do you guys use the term inception? I had never heard that before Ticketmaster. Okay, well, we're always incepting. We're always having these like three day long, get 40 people in a room and come up with tons of ideas workshops. We're actually having one tomorrow. Um, and of course, we just put every single idea that we could think of just through the whole kitchen sink in there and came up with a mission statement. So after looking at all the fan problems, all the technology problems, we decided that this is our mission. Like we believe that if we create an end-to-end -end experience that's fast and personal, it'll result in higher conversion. People will come back to the app and we'll have fan satisfaction. So this is the principle that we've been operating on. Every time we try a new idea or try a new feature, we think, is it fast? Is it personal? Is it engaging? And just kind of using that as our North Star. Um, so we're still trying to figure out how we're going to solve all of this. Um, from the technology side, we thought we need one app to rule them all. Any Lord of the Rings fans in here? And we need the return of the king. We need an Aragon from a foreign land to come in and save us. And what we found was this guy named Tom Bray who wrote the book on React Native. And he had developed a successful app at Ticketmaster called Ticker on the React Native platform. And he came to us, the white knight on a horse, and said, hey, there's this great new JavaScript technology. You can make it in React Native. You can take iOS and Android components. And it's easy to release that into both stores simultaneously. And also, you don't need to wait for Apple Store approval because you can do just code pushes over the air. So you can do really fast development in React Native, much faster than you can do in iOS and Android. And so we really started to embrace that idea of having this one code base that could be reused for both platforms. And we also looked at progressive web apps as well as instant apps because I believe in the next decade that there will no longer be an app store where you download an app. I think it's going to be archaic. It's going to be like going into Best Buy and buying a piece of software off the shelf and going home and installing it. Like you'll get something on your phone and it will look and function like a native app, but it will be probably web based and it just won't be the same that it is today. So we want to build something for the future. And then we keep having to think about the fan, like how can we bring them in? So we really wanted to focus on product research. Um, internal user testing is really important, so we launched an internal beta program. And then we hooked it up to Slack, so people can go download this prototype version of the app, provide feedback, goes into a Slack channel, for me primarily, to gather everybody's feedback. And then we started using things like usertesting.com and Alpha. You guys used Alpha? They're really nice. We don't have an official contract with them yet. <laughs> We're waiting until January to do that, but they um, do user testing where you can reach out to thousands of people, and then in a couple of days, you can get so much user feedback. So you can do mocks and wireframes and video. Um, Alpha is a good testing platform. And then we've been bringing in fans every single week, giving them $50 gift cards for an hour of their time, and just talking to them about what's important to them. And that's what I'll be doing tomorrow morning. So it's a lot of engagement. It's a, it's a lot of work. And we're looking also to hire um, a UX researcher, if anybody knows anybody. <laughs> because we do need somebody dedicated to doing this, but we don't have anybody. So it just falls into product hands. So we thought about our strategy. And we put together this beautiful, elegant roadmap. And we're like, how will we get to replacing the iOS and Android app? And our, our VP, Gordon, presented this to Jared, the president of North America Ticketmaster. And the timeline stretched out into June, which is a million light years from now in like product development. And of course, he came back to us and said, how can you go faster? Any Spaceballs fans? This is my favorite yeah. movie. <laughs> yes. And so they're like, Jared's like, we need you to go faster. And we're like, ah. Oh. So we had to like go back to the drawing board and figure out we can't wait until June. We've got to have something a lot sooner. Um, and so we started thinking about 
what can we do that's going to be so revolutionarily different in this app? Like, what's its value proposition going to be? Michael Rapino is the head of Live Nation, which owns Ticketmaster. And he's been going around on Twitter and elsewhere telling everybody that, like, the days of the paper ticket are numbered. We still have paper tickets right now. We still have standard mail tickets that you can't even track through the USPS that get sent to you. But he's so into this idea of mobile entry and being able to use um, near field communication on your phone, not even having your phone turned on, but just having your phone and that's your identity. And so we were thinking like, is there something we can do around identity, around mobile entry? And then we also wanted to realize that this is a more exclusive experience. So when we went out and talked to people, it's not necessarily about age, it's about comfortability, but there were a lot of people who associated the desktop experience with being safe. Like it's safe to have my credit card there and it's safe to go and look at a map view on the desktop because I'm gonna find the seat that I'm looking for. Like being on my mobile device, I don't feel as safe, I don't feel like I have all the information that I need. Um, and so we decided that we were gonna make this mobile first, but it wasn't gonna be for everybody. It was truly gonna be for that more super fan who's comfortable on their mobile device, who buys a ticket on the mobile device and expects mobile entry. Believe it or not, it has been so hard to champion this at Ticketmaster, the idea of not having a paper ticket, of letting that go, like that, that fear that they just want to have the paper somehow, and being able to convince people that it's going to be okay. I don't care about paper tickets at all. We have talked about providing souvenirs for those of you who absolutely need to have something for a scrapbook, but I want to build for the future. Like this app is maybe two or three years down the road, we won't have any more paper tickets, but right now we do. But I'm still focused on the future and slowly dragging the rest of my team along with me. So the other thing that's interesting about being a product manager at Ticketmaster, and I don't know why all of you became product managers, but I became a product manager because I wanted to change the rules. Um, the company that I was working at, I was supporting a lot of fan-facing features that weren't working properly. And the more I dug into it, I realized it's because the requirements weren't written properly and the rules weren't written properly. And my argument was, well, we wrote the software. Can't we change the rules? And so I thought, if I become a product manager, then I can change the requirements and then I can make things better. And then I got to Ticketmaster. And then I realized that I'm on the B2C side and there's somebody over there in the shadows negotiating with, you know, the forum or the Greek or the Hollywood Bowl that I don't even know. And they're coming up with all the requirements and I'm just getting it downstream. And I was like, no, this is not why I got into this. Like, I've got to find a way to get ahead of all of this. So then we came up with a strategy where we thought, what if we just partner with a couple of five-star clients? And so we picked Niederlander, who does Hamilton, Lion King with Disney on Broadway. And we thought, what if we just take our experience that we want to build and we focus more on building for this five-star client and we get them really excited and invested and then hopefully they will propagate and you know spread the news to other people and we'll be able to change the requirements, like really weird, obscure requirements that existed decades ago that don't even apply in today's world. So that's what I'm focused on changing is because I want things to be better and I want to know like why can't we do certain things and why are there those restrictions and how do we change these restrictions. Can you can you give a couple examples of the requirements that you want Sure. To so this is awful, but you cannot buy wheelchair accessible seats on most um, Ticketmaster platforms. Like you will open a map, you will see a wheelchair seat, you'll tap on it, and it will tell you to call a phone number or fill out a form. And I'm like, that's horrible. And it's because we, we do have this technology that allows people who want an ADA seat to buy it directly, but not all the venues wanted to take the time to integrate with it or support the technology. And so we're making it a requirement. We're saying like, no, you can buy a visually impaired seat or a hearing impaired or a seat. That's just how it is. And you've got to integrate with this thing and you've got to support it because it's, it's right for the fans. So I'm just looking at every tiny little requirement and figuring out, is this the best experience for the fan and why isn't it and what can I push back on? I'm like super passionate about it. Um, so we have Jason Giles, as some of you may know here, and he's our head of design on this, pro on this project. And he's helping us with our guiding principles. Um, we're definitely doing everything mobile first. 
Um, even if we're doing something that's like a progressive web app or an instant app that can scale the desktop, it's still focused on mobile, which is really great because we don't have an editor. I've always worked with a content writer. We have no content writer, so we're just writing our own content. But when you're mobile first, you're focused on using as few words as humanly possible and big icons and adapting those design principles. We did think about two taps and you're done, like tap once to select your seat, tap once to buy your tickets, and that's it. It started out that way. There's a few more taps at the moment, but we're still trying to get to the two taps. We're like, how can we get to the two taps? Um, we're also working on the principle that we want to show everything at once. So how many people are going to see Hamilton or wish they could see Hamilton? A few people. So we thought like, what if we took the Hamilton Theater, and what if we could show everything in that theater at once? What if we could show all the dates, and all the prices, and all the seats, and just expose all the inventory, all the special offers that you could get, all the discounts that you could get? Because I think one of the things that's, that's hard with like Hamilton or those long-running shows is that people are constantly clicking back and forth, or tapping back and forth, or trying to find the date, or trying to find the price, or trying to find the seat all of these different factors and so we're like how can we expose all of that on a map and in thinking about that we thought well we want to highlight everything we don't want to filter out or hide anything and that's been a challenge with the designers because a lot of them have been at Ticketmaster for a long time and they're used to filters like filter out your special packages filter out your wheelchair accessible seats and I thought about it differently I'm like what if somebody comes into the map for the first time and they've never used it but they see a wheelchair icon, what if they tap on it and all the wheelchair icons get expanded and exposed? And then what if it asks, do you want the font to be bigger? Or maybe we change the color scheme, or maybe we invert the colors. Like, well, what if we start to anticipate people's needs? And what if we start to make it like a choose your own adventure, where you start tapping on different areas of the map and all of a sudden more things get exposed, like special offers. Or maybe you'll tap on a seat and maybe it'll show like, for $40 more, you could get this special package, or for $20 less, you could sit a little bit back. So how can we use real-time intelligence to make recommendations so that we don't have to have filters, but we're just kind of highlighting and exposing different areas for people on the map? All of that is very challenging to tell a designer that's been at a company for a long time, because <laughs> they're like, whoa, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Um, it's, it's hard to change the mindset. We've had some new people come in, which is good. The old people who have post-traumatic stress disorder, we're just trying to help them get to a better place emotionally so that they're, they feel more free to come up with new and exciting ideas. And that's the thing that I wanted everyone to know on the team is that, hey, great ideas can come from anywhere. Like, I want everyone to be sketching. I want everyone to be dreaming about this app as much as I am. Um, and definitely trying to get inspiration from places. Did anyone go to Google I.O.? Google Playtime? It was really cool. I was telling Jeff it was like Coachella for nerds. LCD sound system played. Um, but it was great to go to those different kinds of lectures and forums because we started to learn about augmented reality. So I thought, how can you take your phone into a venue and maybe you hold it up and you see special things? Or maybe we take something like a media-rich background from a company like I.O. Media and we embed it in that experience. Maybe you hold up your phone and you get some sort of view from seat as you're sitting in your living room, see what it looks like. I think augmented reality is gonna be much bigger than virtual reality. Just because virtual reality is like, you have something on your head and you can't see anything. Augmented reality, you can interact with your environment. Um, and I went to Google Playtime, which was more about the Play Store and the Android apps. And then there I am by a cupcake in a Mountain View. And but it was really fun to go all these, to all these events and learn about machine learning and learn about the latest you know, ways to develop algorithms. Um, and also there was a lecture on developing with emotions involved, like thinking about how people feel about something and what it makes them happy or sad. And I really like that sort of thing. So we just started drawing as a team and we started sketching things. And the ideas just kept coming really fast and furious. Um, we created a product riff section and I don't know about you, but all the white guys in my 40s I work with love the word riff. They just love to riff on things. It's like this very casual, informal time where everybody gets together. You just draw stuff on the wall. No idea is bad. Um, but you're just supposed to come up with as much interesting stuff as you can. And from that, we started to develop 
these more um, like put together mocks. We don't have our branding figured out. We've gone to like black and gold. I'm not sure how that decision was made. <laughs> um, we might go back to the Ticketmaster branding, but we've thought about this. We thought about this map experience. If anybody wants to volunteer to come to Ticketmaster to like try this out, let me know. Because I could use you guys all as guinea pigs. But we show people this the first time, and we get a lot of interesting feedback. These are supposed to be suggestions of what's available. Some people have thought, is that all that there's available? Like some people haven't noticed the blue dots. Um, some people are looking for a price slider to narrow down the price. Um, these are supposed to highlight different ticket offers, but people don't always see that. We're playing around with the date slider here. So here we have month by month, and here we have day by day. But we're still trying to figure out what to put on here. We're trying to figure out how far in we should zoom. Um, one of the problems is with, we've zoomed in so far, people have lost sight of where the stage is. So we're trying to figure out that. We're, we are taking a lot of design principles from like Google Maps and Apple Maps. We're like, how can we make it feel more like a map? How can we make the interaction feel smoother? So we have developed this prototype. We distributed it internally. And then we've been bringing people into the office every week and making them sign NDAs, except for you guys, and helping us um, figure out, is this a good experience? And this one is a really challenging mess to figure out. <laughs> this is, you, okay, you've selected these four seats, and now we're like, how do we tell people that maybe there's a special offer? Maybe there's a VIP package? Or what if they're gonna go see Disney on Ice and they wanna switch one of those seats to a child seat? So we're trying to think of different things to put here. People have told us that an obstructed seat, they absolutely need to know that seat's obstructed. But I'm like, can we put like a barrier here or some kind of icon signifying, hey, your seat may be blocked or you might have a limited view? Can we put a caution icon? All of this is in flux, but it's really fun to work on. Um, the other thing that is happening is that all this information being surfaced here is coming from the back end, all the metadata. There is a litany of metadata. Like if you let a client decide what they want to put into a venue, they will write, no alcohol allowed, water bottle must be 20 ounces, cannot bring your backpack, like, you write this much stuff. And so once again, we have to go back to the business side and say like, hey, can we help you guys set up something like a nice checkbox? Because like you go to Airbnb and there's just like this really nice list that tells you everything that is involved in the, in the house. And we need something like that to help people if they want to find out more information. So here I'm trying to figure out the information hierarchy. Like what do people absolutely need to see to make a decision? Um, so we're playing around with that. We're playing around like with what happens when you tap on it? What happens when you tap on upgrade available? It's just gonna get more and more complex as time goes on. So this is something that we're still solving for. We're still solving checkout. I've become very obsessed with checkout. Um, insurance is one of those business requirements I couldn't get around because it makes us $80 million a year. And I'm like, fine, okay, we have to have it, but how can we have it nicely so that it doesn't take up all the space? Because if I were to expose this insurance, it's like this much information. We do insurance through Allianz, and I'm definitely one of those people where when somebody tells me like, oh, we have to do it this way because we've always done it, I'm like, no, I don't want to do it that way. I'm a nice, charming person. Maybe I can make a difference. So with Allianz, I got on the phone with them, and I was like, hey, Allianz, it doesn't have video conferencing. I was like on the phone with 16 people in New York, and I was teasing them because they don't even have Zoom or Google Hangouts. And I said, is there a reason why insurance is like so long? Like, can we have an option to like maybe shorten it because we're on a mobile device? And they gave us back some really short text. And I was like, that's great. And then I said, wouldn't it be better if we could like do some personalized messaging to these customers? Like, let's say that you're in LA and you're traveling to New York for the Lion King. Like, wouldn't it be great if you could say like, hey, it looks like you're traveling a long distance. Just know that if you buy ticket insurance and your flight gets delayed, you can get your money refunded. Like something that's more personalized. And they said, yeah, we would totally like to do that, but we've never received any information from Ticketmaster. And so now I'm trying to figure out what is the minimum data that we could give Allianz so that they could send us back a personalized message. And that was a huge win for me. I put that into my year review. I was like, you're welcome. <laughs> that's my contribution. Because 
we just went back to the mission. We're like, we want this app to be personalized. We want people to have a reason to get taken insurance. It's there, and people are like, yes or no, but wouldn't it be better if they knew that you were traveling or they knew that the event was six months out and might get canceled? Just finding some better way to message to the person instead of just this really impersonalized insurance messaging. So we are now talking about how we will launch this thing that we have not finished building. <laughs> do you guys use Taplytics? Do you guys do A-B testing? So this is the first time in my life I've really been able to do A-B testing, and oh my god, is it exciting. Taplytics is a very nice company in Canada, filled with lots of nice Canadian people, and they make it really easy to do visual editing. So you plug in your iPhone or you plug in your Android. You can change the color of things, the icon, the text, do visual stuff as a product manager without having to get developers involved in, in it at all. And you can choose what people see. Like I want 50% of people to see this and 50% to see, see that. Or you can do like four different tests or five different tests. So you can break it out and um, then you can get all of this real-time feedback, which is great because then you can go to your executives and say, this is how it's performing and this is what's doing well and what's not doing well. So we want to use Taplytics to control the success this experience that we roll out because we don't want everyone to see it at once and it helps us control the traffic as well. Um, Android lets you slowly release versions. Apple just came up with the ability, it goes from 1% to 5% to 10%, which I find kind of hilarious. I'm like 1% to 5%, <laughs> it's a strange rollout. Um, but Taplytics is a, is a great resource if anybody is looking to do A-B testing. Um, this is the most challenging thing. So, start, like, software is very emotional. <laughs> like, there are just so many emotions running very high. I don't know if that's true for where you guys work, but I mean, I love everybody I work with, but there are a lot of strong opinions. And, and being a product manager, I, I feel like this, I'm like just trapped in the middle. You know, you've got like the president giving you feedback, and the fans giving you feedback, and your other product managers giving you feedback. And all the time I'm being told, like, Cece, you're the decider. And I'm like, am I really? Like, I understand there's the president of this company who's probably going to decide some things over my head. But the most important advice I was told was to have a really strong point of view. So just develop that really strong point of view. Just put on your big girl pants and go into the meeting and just say, this is what I believe. You have to have the courage of your convictions, especially when things go south. Um, the emotions of other people are difficult to handle, and I'm just choosing like not to handle those. I'm like, you're going to be <laughs> the way you're going to be, and I'm just going to continue to be an undaunted optimist. That's my, um, that's my role in the organization. So it is really difficult to decide like who's the decider in all of this. Have you guys seen the Pentagon Wars? It's fantastic. It's from the late 90s with Carrie Always and Kelsey Grammer. And what happens is there's this guy who's sitting in this room with a bunch of military brass, and they want to develop this tank. And he has to keep going back to Carrie Elways and keep changing the requirements. And there's so much scope creep that by the, t the time this tank gets released, nobody wants it. It doesn't serve any military purpose. It doesn't hardly carry any soldiers. <laughs> it gets the worst design tank on the planet. And that, of course, is my fear, and every product manager's fear, I think, is that we're going to start with two taps and you're done. All of a sudden it's 16 taps and you're not done yet. It's really hard to avoid that scope creep. Um, it's really hard to develop a minimum viable product and who decides what that minimum viable product is. Um, one of the things I do like to always say is, well, let's experiment. Let's release what we have. Let's try it out. Let's get feedback. I think one of the worst things you can do is not pull the trigger and get your product out sooner than later because you need some kind of feedback. And that's really hard to do too, um, especially when as a product manager you're told you're in charge and I'm like, okay, well how much? <laughs> like when can I decide to put this out here? So that's why I did the internal beta. I was like, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to put it out there. I have the power and authority and control and I can start to get feedback before this thing gets to be an unwieldy tank. Um, but it's really important to have that vision. As long as you have that vision, that vision is pulling everybody together. So I just keep going back with the team and say, like, let's just keep focusing. We want to create something that's fast and something that's personalized. Fast, people can find the ticket they're looking for. They can check out easily with no friction. Let's get social login. Let's make it easy to identify who these people are so that we can personalize the experience. Let's get all the integrations that we need. 
Um, and let's just create something that people love. And I always quote Steve Jobs because I was there at Apple for such a long time when he was there. And obviously simpler is always better. So I'm a big believer in that. And also the funny thing about Steve Jobs is that if he were still alive, I wonder what he would think of all this agile and all these MVPs. We have so many product research groups and I think there's so much value in it, but Steve Jobs was like, we're just gonna build something that no one knows until we release it, and then they're gonna wonder how they ever live without it. But I don't suffer any illusions that I'm like Steve, so I'm like, no, I need product focus groups. I need to talk to fans, I need to gather the data, um, but I need to adhere to the vision and try to make it as simple as possible for people and not lose sight of that. So that is what we are currently doing at Ticketmaster. Any questions? Actually, we have one uh, yeah. right in here, the tool that you guys use for A-B testing. Uh, my company uses Optimizely, and it can be a bit of a hassle to get tech initially integrated into the Optimizely, like what we're testing. Yeah. Have you guys had any like trouble linking up the, what was the name? Tabletics. Tabletics to your actual like products, or like how does the build happen versus like, do you build everything in Tabletics and then like? It was so fast. So we have um, we have a bunch of developers. We're working with a bunch of people in Ukraine. They did it in like two hours. And so what happens now is that the, the new prototype app is in Tapletics. So you go into Tapletics, it's there. And then you plug your phone in and you just decide what you want to do. It's so easy and fast to set up experiments. And I, I know about the other one that you're talking about too. We also looked at that. So yeah, we were looking at a platform that could work with React Native and iOS and Android. Tabletics was good. The only bad thing is that all of these SDKs that you introduce into your app will add weight and they will add delays. So you do have to be aware of that. So the what works really well is the fact that it, it relies on React Native. The, the application being built with React Native. Yeah. We think it's going to be a winner, but it's it's funny at the same time, right, because like React Native came out of Facebook, and what if Facebook one day decides, ah, we don't want React Native, then the whole development team is like, but it's open source, so I guess we can still do it. <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny when you choose like what platform you're going to go with, but it's still faster than, than the, the traditional iOS and Android development that we've been doing. It requires less developers as well. How, how, um, how long ago did you guys transition to React Native? About three months ago. So we got, and this was difficult because some people decided not to stay on the team because they're like, well, I'm a diehard iOS developer. Like, why do I want to do React Native? And so we just, the people who wanted to be there, we trained them, and then we hired um, some other contractors who knew React Native, and we took some other people from other teams, kind of cobbled together a core group of people who could work in React. And how long did it take to transition? Like two months. It's not too bad. Like we all went through it. I went through it for three days. By day three, I was like, I don't know. I got lost a long time ago. But <laughs> you guys all seem like you know what you're doing, so good for you. Uh, I was curious. Like you mentioned, the app was kind of targeted towards like super fans, the, this group that like will buy tickets uh, through their mobile phone and have the, the product like tag system like that. Uh, how did you figure out like, or did you guys figure out like what the size of those people are that are currently on your platform? And then uh, tied in with that question, do you guys have personas or segments that you've kind of identified? Ticketmaster, because they've been around for such a long time, they have 12 different personas when you go through their training. And you're like, wow, that is a lot. It's a lot of personas. And so mobile was so different, though. And the thing is that what's awesome about the mobile stuff that we're building, a lot of it is web-based right now and so we're going to take it and we're going to put it back to the desktop version so the desktop people will get to take advantage of it as well but for the mobile people like we really were segmenting out we really were just targeting those people um, who are comfortable buying on a mobile device um, who have their phone on the go with them and it does skew younger it skews like 18 to 34 so we just targeted specifically those people but we really also believe in the future of mobile and the power of mobile and we still have um, the desktop for those that are just more comfortable with using that. Um, let's see. Oh, you first. Thanks. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. 
Uh, one of the questions, at the beginning you, you were saying that uh, uh, one of the challenges for client engagement was um, the incentive for them to come back and use the, uh, use the app. Uh, what sort of like has been some of your, uh, your, your insights in the, into that as to how to figure that out? Well, it's, it's so fascinating. I would challenge any product manager to never assume anything, especially when you work for a big organization. You think, well, somebody's already thought of that. Why would I ever bring that up? When we talk to fans, they would say things like, hey, it would be awesome to know, like, after this pre-sale or on-sale, when you sold all these Harry Style tickets, if there are more tickets when they get released, like, it would be great for me to get a push notification on my phone. And we already thought that that was a no-brainer and that somebody was already doing it. Like the NBA will do that too. They'll release a couple tickets right before the game after their initial sale. And so we're now working with marketing to do like those last-minute push notifications. Like there are some push notification campaigns, but the people that we talk to are really clamoring for it. They're like, if we knew that there were more tickets, we would come back to Ticketmaster. If we knew that there were resale tickets, we wouldn't go to StepHub. It's just like there's all this lost educational opportunity where people just don't know that they can still get a ticket. So we have to work with marketing on that. That was really interesting. I was like, oh yeah, I guess you would never come back if we never told you <laughs> that there were tickets to that band that you wanted. Because um, the other problem that we have right now is that you can heart um, an artist and you can follow them, but it's not integrated everywhere. So if you heart them on the desktop, it doesn't matter on mobile, believe it or not. We're trying to figure out a way to solve that. It's awful, but there's a lot of opportunities, yes. so it's great <laughs> at the same time. Yeah, but it's um, it's interesting. Just go to ahead, go off, just to go and off that. Um, sorry. It's okay. Uh, the low hang. So basically, I think Ticketmaster is basically pushing you guys to do focus groups and get those low hanging fruit. Because I, I've worked with other companies and they are set in their priorities, and it's really hard for like to change the, I don't know, the CIO's mindset to be like, hey, there's a lot of cleanup that we can do. Yeah. Little things that we could, like, like small wins that we can accomplish. So was that like always since you got there? No, okay. no, there has been pretty much zero product research focus. Like they were doing internal testing. And I'm like, no, I don't want to talk to people who already work at Ticketmaster, who already understand technology. Right. Like I want to find the person on the street who wants to go to a concert. So Krisha, as you know, like she was the one who spearheaded it. She was like, let's go find people. And I was talking to my manager and I was like, you know, what if we go to Craigslist or walk into coffee shops? Because that's what you do in the Silicon Valley. You just walk down University Avenue in Palo Alto and talk to everybody in coffee shops. And they were all about it. Like we found a more formal way to do it, but it definitely was more guerrilla style where we just had to go to like one person and get their American Express card and try to go buy gift cards for people. And it was sort of under the radar and it wasn't really sanctioned, but we went out and we did it, and it was successful, and we brought the results back, and then everybody was like, oh, this is great. We should create a position to do this, and we should create a team to do this. So sometimes you just have to. Right, I like the whole inception. Go out. Yeah, <laughs> it's like the whole yeah. inception, like throw everything in the sink, like let's go ahead and go over everybody's ideas. Oh my gosh, so, we came up with so many interesting ideas that we right. never would have thought of, like having a chat bot inside the app to help you and check out or choose your tickets like that. What were you going to ask? I had two questions. Um, as far as what's the percentage of uh, desktop sales versus mobile? And then the second question I had is, have y'all looked into the, like, the airline industry and what they're doing as far as you can pick out tickets like, you know, days in the Fantasia did really well, like Kayak and people like that. As far as, um, because you were saying, talking about pricing and kind of saw the design you did and have y'all looked into how the airline really, really captivates people to buy tickets as far as, like, I think Southwest is like, Every Tuesday, they send out those emails as far as what tickets are dropping price. You know, they have like the special club where hey, you can get nine dollar tickets, right? So if y'all look into that, because I look at the airline industry so much like ticket industry, right? It's people buying seats. Yeah. Right? So it's like if y'all look into that, and especially like Google buying that, um, is it the company that actually creates the the software that does all the ticket sales throughout the internet, right? So create that they guy similar to what they have. They got lots of that as well. Yeah, I mean, you're totally right. I used to work for Expedia slash Hotwire, and there's like opt-ins for last minute deal alerts and last minute tickets, and we don't have anything like that. So that's like a huge opportunity that we could have there is like alert me when the price drops or alert me when these tickets go on sale. So that's, that is something that we want to add. And then um, 
desktop right now is is outpacing mobile, but mobile is like slowly catching up. Um, but people are just more familiar with the desktop site. It's also the comfortability around maps. So that's like a problem that we are trying to solve on the mobile device. Is how do we render 90,000 seats instantly and make it an easy experience on the map? I still think we're going to have to convince some people, <laughs> but but we do want to do it. We do still we still see it as an opportunity to do it for that person on the go. Um, and just and then the value proposition for mobile is to take that technology and put it back on the desktop site. So at least we have both our bases covered. And whatever new technology we're doing, we're propagating it throughout the company. I think if you're in that space of mobile and you've got a desktop um, business like in, in your company, you should definitely partner with them and say like, hey, how can we both win together? Like definitely don't try to do something so different that they can't use it at all because that would cause some friction <laughs> between the two. Um, but yeah, it's. But we do. We still think mobile is the way of the future, and people don't even know when they're on an app. Like we ask them, like, do you buy tickets on their phone? And they could be on a website or they could be on an M dot site. It's just as far as they know, they're on their phone, so they're they think they're using an app. And there's a lot of different mobile channels for them to come into. I think I know. Um, the reason I, there's several reasons, but one of the reasons I use desktop is when I'm buying tickets that are going on sale in like 30 seconds. Yeah. As opposed to mobile, like, I'm like, mm, like, mobile, like low inventory. Yeah. yeah, we're trying to solve that problem. We're thinking of that. creating a thing called the waiting room. Exactly. <laughs> so it's right? like, yeah, I'll have five tabs open. Yeah. yeah so. And that's what we, we talked to people who did that. They had like Chrome, Safari, yeah, Firefox, yeah. and they had <laughs> iOS and Android. Yes. They had everything and they were like waiting. <laughs> And we're like, oh, how can we solve this problem on mobile? Like, how could we guarantee these people a seat? How could we truly put them in line? Because right now it says you're in line for tickets, but I don't know where they are. But they are not in line for anything. <laughs> so if we could really realistically say, like, you are number 987, at least they would, like, know yeah. when we would give them some fashion Push information. They're like, oh, number 10. Yeah, exactly. I came up with them. Um, we had that earlier this year and it was really successful. It was this notify me feature in the app where you, you could be notified the like two hours before it went on sale or five minutes to get ready. But yeah, we have to solve the high demand situation um, because that is when, if you're on a mobile device and you don't have lots of tabs, how else do you get in line and how else do you find out what you can buy at that exact second? The other thing is the identity part. So right now a verified fan, you have to get a code manually put the code in. I'm like, that's horrible. You should just log in. It should know who you are, and it should put you in line. So we're definitely moving more toward that model. Like, give us your login information, and we'll put you in line. And that's the incentive. Um, because right now, it's like 10% of people log in. Yeah. But we don't know who those people are. Just anonymous people looking for tickets, and we want to know who you are. True. Yeah. Yes? Um, I don't know if you did this, but when the road club tickets for that you already exhibit, they were um, looking at IP addresses and kicking you off via multiple tabs. And it's even, like, so if you had your mobile phone and you're, you're on the yeah, same they thing, they would be like, this is your same, like, because they would actually give you a number. So that's ah. just your number 30,000 out of 50,000. But the thing is, I mean, looking at those numbers, you kind of, you only, you're, there are only 50,000 tickets available. Yeah. So many people buy at least two tickets, you are already kind of like, maybe you wouldn't get a ticket. But they did the waiting room concept where you go in an hour early and wait in line. The waiting room, and then also this is like not top secret, but you guys can tell anyone. Um, <laughs> what we're also coming up with is like right now in Ticketmaster, when you go to buy a ticket, you have a timer. It counts down. Yeah. You are carting your seat, and you are putting it in a shopping cart. With the new experience we're coming up with, um, there is no timer. There is no carting. You tap it. You buy it. You're done. And so we're coming up with a whole new way to build the architecture so that. We avoid collisions, but then we also avoid fraud. So one of the reasons it's hard to get tickets is because like bots and bad actors will cart tickets and they'll hold on to them, but they won't complete the transaction. And so we got away from CAPTCHA, and now we're trying to get away from people having to enter their security code for their debit card. So they're like, if we have people log in and we don't have a timer, and you're not actually carting the ticket, but you're just buying it and getting the order and then getting the ticket. Can we reduce fraud and can we make it happen faster for people um, and not kick them out, <laughs> obviously, would be good too. So does that require a login first and then a purchase? And then yeah, which we're going to have to A-B test. I would like the login. My manager is skeptical. <laughs> yes. 
Oh, did you have a question? Well, I was going to ask you actually about uh, like, to that point. Are you guys doing anything with, like blockchain type stuff? For the um, A/B like, testing? No, no, for like fraud prevention, like that kind of stuff, like blockchain technology. So there's a there's a bunch of algorithms on the back end with fraud, and it will do its best to figure out if you're a real person, and it, what it will try to calculate is intent. So obviously, if you've logged in, you have past purchase history, then it knows you're a real person. But there's all these gates that you have to jump through. There's all these hoops, and if it doesn't think that you're a real person, or if it thinks that you're a broker and you're a bot, um, then it will make it harder for you to purchase. And then there's a there's a limit of six tickets per order. Um, in some situations, so like every time you go into one of these different channels, you're constantly engaging with these fraud algorithms. It's really interesting. Um, but I'm hoping that with I, with logging in and maybe two-factor authentication or a little bit more security, like how PayPal verifies your phone number and that this is your mobile device, that we can help people just <coughs> log in and get in and then they don't have to be faced with all of these different fraud hoops to jump through. But it is a constant process to, to fight the, the bots, mainly in Russia. <laughs> when you talked about artificial learning, is that what you were alluding to? There's the fraud? Fraud is one part of the artificial learning. Um, what we're looking for from personalization is that you go into the map for the first time and it's a cold start. So we might show you a couple of markers. But the second time you come in, like we'll know how many people you're purchasing for what price range you normally have, where you where you normally sit, and we want to get to the place that we're so sophisticated that we could send you a text message and say like, hey, there's two tickets to Taylor Swift. Do you want to buy them? You press one for yes, we buy your tickets. Like we want to get to that space where we know you so well that we can just buy your tickets for you and maybe integrate with Alexa. Like Alexa, buy me two tickets to Taylor Swift, and then it just does it. That's 